Great to see you here on Memorial Day weekend, and uh, I was out last week in Philadelphia with one of our church plants, and they're doing great. They're running about over 300 and about to plant another church in that area, so I was uh, able to preach there and encourage them, so that was a great, great time, but I'm glad to be back here with you today. And so, I, I want to start off with a question. What comes to your mind when you think of the word fair, or you hear the word fair, All right, right off the bat? Some of you, you're going to think of a place like the state fair, or a book fair, or a job fair, or maybe the world's fair, okay? Some of you don't think of a place, you think of a phrase like a fair ball, or fair game, or if you've been watching Lord of the Rings or something, the Fair Maiden, right? And if you're a Mavs fan now and you didn't used to be, Fair Weather Fan might come to mind. Uh, but then, of course, there's Fair Skinned, and uh, of course, all those <laughs> might be, all those might be something that would come to your mind right off the bat, the word fair. Now, now think of the word being treated fairly, right? Or, or how, if some uh, fairness, right? What comes to your mind there? Maybe you think about like the statue of justice. And there she is with her eyes blindfolded. And she's impartial. She's, she's not swayed by outside force. Her scales are even, even handed to everyone. That's kind of what we think about fairness. But unfortunately, we don't live really in a world like that. We don't, we don't live in a world where things are often fair. In fact, quite honestly, many times we, we find ourselves saying, that's not fair, right? That's not fair. And uh, so we're going to be looking at Habakkuk because Habakkuk is living in a time where he thinks that things that are happening around him are simply not fair. Fair. So once you get your Bible, once you open up with me to Habakkuk chapter one, and if again you can use that table of contents, or if you're using the the Bible in the seat, we put the page number up there for you. But just a small little book in the Old Testament. Habakkuk was a prophet in the Old Testament, lived about 630 years uh, before the time of Jesus. He lived in the southern part of Judah in Israel. And he lived in a time when it was a moral freefall, a spiritual freefall. He, uh, they had had a great revival, and now they're on the back end of it, and it was straight down. And so Habakkuk begins this, this book, this, this book of Habakkuk, with a complaint. God, where are you? God, there's all, my, all this corruption around us. God, there's all this immorality around us. God, why don't you do something, God? Where are you? Why don't you do something? And then in chapter, in verse five, God says, I am doing something, Habakkuk. Uh, and he says, you know what I'm going to you know do? I, I'm going to go get these Chaldeans, the, these Babylonians, and uh, they're a ruthless group, a godless group, and I'm going to bring them against Israel. And they're going to they're gonna trounce on you, and they're going to drag you into Babylon for 70 years, and only a remnant of God's people will survive to repopulate the nation. That's, that's kind of my plan. And uh, uh, needless to say, Habakkuk is not too fired up about that plan. <laughs> that's not really what he had in mind when he said, God, do something. And so we get to uh, verse 12 of chapter 1, and Habakkuk is basically going to say, God, that's not really fair. God, that's not fair. God, you need to do something else. Don't you have a plan B, God? Because this is simply not fair. Now, listen, if you're here today and you're like, I don't think God's been fair to me, or I don't think life is fair to me, then I want you to really listen up. Because God wants to speak to you out of his word, right where you are this morning, okay? So let's look at it. Hebrews, I mean, I'm sorry, not Hebrews, Habakkuk uh, chapter one, beginning at verse 12. And this is the word of God, amen? amen? Are you not from eternity, Lord my God, my holy one? You will not die. Lord, you appointed them to execute judgment. My rock, you destined them to punish 
us. Now stop right there. Habakkuk he hears what God has got planned and immediately his response in shock is to go back to who God is. Notice he said, God, you're, you're from eternity, are you not? He's not really asking a question. He's making a statement. God, you're, you're eternal. God, you see eternity, future, eternity, past. God, you see the whole thing. And then he begins to call out the names of God. In fact, this would be a great thing for you to do. Just circle these names right there in this verse, verse 12. The first one is the word Lord. That's the word Yahweh. That's a covenant name for God. Uh, the second one is my God, uh, which is the Hebrew word Elohim, which is more of a generic term for God. Then there's the word Holy One. Circle that one. That's the word Kadesh, which means one who is set apart one who is without sin. And then there's the word rock or rock of ages, like we just sang about, that means steady, stable, constant, immutable, unchanging. And so what is he doing? He's saying, God, you're, you're, God, you're perfect. God, you're over everything. God, I know who you are, and yet you destined them to punish us? You chose them to punish us? In fact, you might could underline those words appointed and destined. What that really means there is that God's not up there in heaven wringing his hands going, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do with this person? How am I going to work through that? He's not like, like that. He's got a plan, right? Nor is God indifferent and kind of out there somewhere busy doing something else and we're left to ourselves. No, that's not the case either. It says here that God has got a plan. We saw that in verse five. He said, I am doing something. I'm at work. I have a plan. I have a purpose in mind. And he's like, God, I, I see that you have a plan, but I don't really like your plan. Anybody feel that way? God, I see you've got a plan, but I don't really like your plan right now. I don't like how things are rolling out for me. Look at verse 13. He continues, your eyes are too pure to look on evil and you cannot tolerate wrongdoing. So why do you tolerate those who are treacherous? Why do you silent, or are you silent while one who is wicked swallows up one who is more righteous than himself? He's like, God, you're, you're, I know who, your character, God. You, you can't even look on evil. God, you, you punish those who do wrong. So God, why in the world, I'm just adding that part for emphasis, why in the world, God, would you use them, these terrible people, these God, they, you know how ruthless they are, God? You know how terrible they are, God? You're going to use them? I mean, I know we're bad, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm again, I, I went back to chapter one, verse one. I said, I knew there's a problem. But God, in comparison, they're a whole lot worse. You know, I mean, at least we tried to worship you and, you know, we had your prophet. But God, now these people, they're just downright terrible people. And you're going you're gonna to use them. You're going to raise them up and pull us down? Really? You might feel the same way, right? Okay, God, uh, I know this person, they don't, they don't. You know, you, they don't want kids, and, and look what they're doing. You give them a child, and, and here we are praying, 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 and, and we don't have any children. Or God, you know, I, I've been trying so hard at work to just, do, just be so honoring to you and have spiritual conversations and live a godly life, and, and, and this godly, godless dude gets promoted, you know, and then here I am, I, I, I'm looked over. You know, or God, you know what, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to walk with you, God. By the way, you might be tempted to say, God, don't you know how much I've done for you? I mean, I show up on almost every Sunday, almost, right? Every Sunday, you know, and, and, I, and I serve and I, God, don't you remember how I gave that one time and, and how I've done all these things for you? God, surely you're not going to promote these people and, and, and not listen to me. What's going on here? You feel that tension? We, we all feel it, don't we? I mean, if we're really honest, we've had these conversations with God. And by the way, you're not the only one. There are multiple people throughout Scripture that have, have struggled with this very same thing, the, the rise of the wicked and the putting down of the godly, and it just doesn't seem fair. It's not fair. 
In fact, you could write in the margin of your Bible right there next to Habakkuk 13, you could write Psalm 73. We don't really have time to get into Psalm 73, but it's a wonderful psalm about this very thing. In fact, a good homework assignment for you this week uh, to read Psalm 73, meditate on it. But let me just give you a little flavor of it. In verse 1, the psalmist writes this, God is indeed good to Israel, to the pure in heart, but as for me, my feet almost slipped. My steps nearly went astray, for I envied the arrogant. I saw the prosperity of the wicked. He's like, God, yeah, I know you're good. All right, that's the Sunday school answer, right? God, I know you're good. You're right. (laughs) But, (laughs) that's where reality hits. But, (laughs) man, I nearly lost my footing. I nearly fell away from the faith because I saw the wicked people promoted and the godly people put down. And it just doesn't seem right. He continues in verse 12, look at them, the wicked, they're always at ease and they increase their wealth. Did I purify my heart and wash my hands in innocence for nothing? Wow, you can really hear the frustration. Did I just do all this for nothing, God? Are you really not paying attention to me now? And then in verse 16, he says, when I tried to understand all this, it seemed hopeless. It seemed hopeless. This is really where Habakkuk is. He's wrestling. He's wrestling. Remember, that's his name. means to grapple, to grasp. And he's wrestling with God. God, it just doesn't seem fair to me. God, why are you raising these people up to punish us? This isn't fair. And in fact, he goes on in verse 14 to give an illustration of how bad these Chaldeans really are. In fact, look at it. Look at verse 14. He said, you made mankind like the fish of the sea, like marine creatures that have no ruler. The Chaldeans pull them up with a hook and catch them in their drag nets and gather them in their fishing nets. That is why they are glad and and rejoice. That is why they sacrifice to their drag net and burn incense to their fishing net for by these things their portion is rich and their food is plentiful. Will they therefore empty their nets and continually slaughter nations without mercy? What is he saying? He kind of equates the nations of the world to fish in, you know, in a, in a lake, all right? I, I, let me just go ahead and say, I, I am a terrible fisherman, all right? I just, I embrace that. I, I got, I, we got to stay in our own lanes, right? We got to be self-aware. I'm not really good at fishing, all right? I'd like to be. I'm really not very good at fishing, but I have a friend that's really good at fishing, all right? I mean, he's got the boat. He's got all the gear. He's even got that sono thing that, that sees all the fish under the water. I mean, that's not even fishing, really. It's not fair. And so, like, he'll pull over to a school of fish, and he'll say, watch this. He said, I'm going to drop this hook down and hit that fish on its nose. And sure enough, here come the hook, and it'll just, boop, hit that fish on the nose, and that fish will bite it, and he'll pull it right on up. I'm on the other end of the boat going, yeah, you know, I can't get anything, right? And he's over there. He's got it all going on because he knows how to do it. That's exactly what he said these Chaldeans are like. He said they're like, they're just like pulling the nations up like fishermen with fish on a hook, stringing them on a line. And God, they don't even know you. God, they don't even worship you. They, they worship their false gods and their false deities. And God, how in the world does it seem fair that you let them trample on us? God, that's just not fair. You know, many times we feel like God's not fair. And when we do, let's just be really honest, okay? We're we're in church, right? So we can just be honest. We can just be honest. We we tend to put ourselves self as a self-appointed judge of God. Well, God, you're not being fair to me. You're not treating me right. You, you should be doing such and such to me. And God, you're not, you're not being honest with your word. And God, you're not. And, and we get angry with God and we push God away. And we're so upset with God because we don't think that he's treating us fairly. When in reality, the problem is that we don't understand what God is doing. The National Institute of Health has a test for those that are presenting stroke symptoms. 
to help ascertain where the stroke is and, and, and its damage. So if you present symptoms like that, you go to the hospital, they will quickly rush you in and they'll start doing all these tests. One of the tests is to show you a piece of paper that has a picture on it. And usually the picture has several different items on the page. And they will ask you the question, what do you see? And of course, based on what you tell them you see on the page determines what side of the brain is affected by the stroke because you really physically cannot see those other items that are on the page. If you and I look at the page, we can see the whole thing, but that person can only see a portion of the page. They cannot see the other half. Now listen, in many ways, we're only seeing a portion of the picture. We only see a little bit of it. We don't see the whole picture of what God sees. We don't see the, the, the whole story of all that God is doing. So from our vantage point, the, the sliver that we see, we think God's not being fair because we can't see the whole picture. And so what God is going to say to Habakkuk here is that I have a bigger picture that you cannot see. So you're going to have to trust me with the part you can't see until eventually you do see it. So how do you do that? How do you navigate a season when you don't feel like life is treating you fairly? So I want to give you, I'm going to get down real practical today, all right? We're going to, I'm going to just give you three very practical things you can start doing right now that will help you gain your footing when life doesn't seem fair, okay? So the first one I want you to do is I want you to, to listen to God. Listen to God. Look at Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1. He said, I will stand in my guard post and station myself on the lookout tower, and I will watch to see what he will say to me and what I should reply about my complaint. Now, I used to think when I read that verse years ago that, you know, Habakkuk is basically pouting. He's like, I'm going to stand right here, and God's going to have to answer me for everything he's doing, you know, with the bottom lip stuck out, right, in pouting position. But on further study, I really think that Habakkuk is doing the right thing. What is Habakkuk doing? Habakkuk said, I'm going to go to a place where I'm alone and I'm going to cry out to God and I'm going to ask God to speak to me about what he's doing and that is a good thing. Habakkuk was putting, get this, he's putting himself in a position to hear from God. And many times in our life when we're struggling with what's happening or we're trying to make sense, we need to get ourselves in a position to hear from God. So what does that mean to get ourselves in a position to hear from God? Let me give you a couple of real simple things. Number one, you need to find a place of solitude. You need to find a place where you're quiet, where you're alone. He, he goes to a watchtower. He goes to a tower way up at the top. Nobody else, it's like going to a deer lease, right? I'm, I'm just going to go into this deer stand. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to leave this stand until I hear from God. It's that kind of idea. I'm just going to get alone. Now listen, you need to get alone. Uh, and here's the deal. Turn the phone off. Take the earbuds out. Uh, no, no, don't even put on like Christian music, all right? I know some of you would freak out in five minutes of silence, all right? You'd think you'd just combust, all right? But you won't. You actually will survive. And, and here's the deal. You, you allow the white noise to come down. You allow the RPMs to come down in your life. And you actually get still enough to hear God's voice. That God wants to speak to you. So it's a place of solitude. It's also a place of scripture. You need to get to a place where you can just take in high volume doses of God's word, right? High volume doses. I'm just mean like you're, you are reading the scriptures. You're maybe doing a quiet time in the morning and the one in the afternoon and the one in the evening and, and you're just asking God to speak to you. Maybe you're just reading whole books all the way through. Maybe you're uh, in a place where you're just going to listen to Bible teaching because we need the scripture taught to us. Not just what somebody else thinks you should do, but what does God say you should do? And so you need to be taking in the scripture, soaking up the scripture, meditating, memorizing on the scripture. This is how God speaks to us. He speaks primarily through his word. And then also you need a place of support. 
You need a place of support. That means you need to be around other godly people who will pray with you and encourage you and remind you of the promises of God. You know, I really believe that there's a direct correlation to those who have this support system around them that continue on and walk with God and persist through difficult times and those who do not have that support system that fall away. I really believe, I've seen it over and over and over and over again. I remember when Liz and I were young, we were in seminary, we were going through a challenging time and this couple invited us over to their house and we got on our knees by their couch and we prayed and prayed. And there wasn't anything magical about it. There wasn't anything super spiritual about it. But I, rem- I have this mental image of us on our knees by the couch. And I wonder, when was the last time you were on your knees by your couch with somebody praying over something that's on your heart? Yeah, I know you pray when you're doing the dishes. I know you pray when you're driving. I know you pray when you're kind of, when your mind is going other places. But I'm talking about on your knees by the couch, crying out to God with somebody else helping you. This is, this is putting yourself in a position to really hear from God. And Habakkuk is doing that. The first thing you need to do when you're saying, God, this isn't fair, is you got to pull away. That's your sign. That's your trigger to go, okay, i got to get away. i gotta, I got I to gotta get where I can hear from God on this because my perspective is getting whacked out here. Number one, listen to God. The second thing you need to do is you need to write down what God says. Look at, look at he, uh, Habakkuk 2, verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 2. The Lord answered me, write down this vision, clearly inscribe it on tablets so one may easily read it. He's like, Habakkuk, I want you to write this down. Habakkuk, get out the pen and paper. Habakkuk, get out the chisel and the tablet. Habakkuk, uh, you know, fire up the computer. Write this down because of what I'm going to say, I want you to remember and I want you to pass on, All right? Now, the same thing is true. Whenever you are in that season, oh, God, it's not fair. I'm going to pull away. I'm going to put myself in a position to hear from God. And then I'm going to have some paper out. I'm going to have a pen ready. I'm going to have my computer fired up. And what God is saying, I'm going to write it down. And this is very, very important. I believe there's a direct correlation between those who really walk with God deeply and intimately and those who journal. The reason why is because there's something about processing God's word that you hear him through his word and you write it down and you're able to remind yourself of God's promises that is vital to your spiritual growth. And I believe your spiritual enemy wants to take away from you what God wants to give to you. God will give you promises. God will give you comfort. God will remind you of of scriptures that are so important to you that will buoy you up and encourage you in those hard times. But if you don't write it down, you will forget it. And it will be taken from you. And I've told you many times, I've got journals in my home, my office that go back 30 years of recorded conversations, some high times and low times and hard times, you know, good times and bad times, but God encouraging, God directing, God leading, sometimes God warning. And I'm so thankful that I wrote it down, that I wrote it down. I was in a Bible study with a group of uh, businessmen a couple of weeks ago, and we, we were talking about this. And one gentleman said, uh, he said, I I try to write down, every time I'm spending time in God's word, I try to write down something that God said to me that day. And then also write down where I see God at work. Maybe God's answer to prayer or God's moving in somebody's heart. I write it down. He said, not only so that I can remember it, but I can share it with somebody else. And I love that. I mean, how great would it be to be able to share this with your family and share this with coworkers because you, you have it written, distilled and written down. That's why he's saying to Habakkuk, write it down. Habakkuk, you, I, what I'm about to tell you, I want you to write down because you're going to have to share this with somebody else. And listen, as you're going through a hard time and the struggle and the God's not fair and then you're, they get away and God's speaking to you and you write it down, that is then your message to share with those who are watching you. That's your message of encouragement to other people. So how do I get through? How do I navigate through when life doesn't seem fair? I I listen to God. I get away. I hear from him. I write down what he says. And then lastly, jot this down, wait in faith. Wait 
in faith. Look at verse 3. He said, uh, for the vision is yet for the appointed time. It testifies about the end and will not lie. Though it delays, wait for it, since it will certainly come and not be late. I love this verse 3 because it is, uh, it, it's a reminder of the sovereignty of God. You know what the sovereignty of God is? Sovereignty of God, uh, the word reign is in the word sovereign. It, it means to rule. John Piper, some of you are familiar with him. John has written several books, retired pastor in Minnesota. He wrote this defining the sovereignty of God. He said, God has the rightful authority and the freedom and the wisdom and the power to bring about everything he intends to happen. All right? I love that. God's going to bring about everything he intends to happen. God's going to bring about everything. All right, let me, let me, this is the audience participation part. Get ready. God's going to bring about. Okay, one more time. God's going to bring about everything he has planned to have. But so-and-so can thwart God. No, no, no. God's going to bring about everything. Everything. And so that's exactly what he's saying here. Five times in this one verse, he said, what I'm telling you, Habakkuk, is going to happen. Notice five times. Number one, he says, it is the appointed time. Number two, it will continue to the end, he said. Number three, it will not lie. Number four, it will certainly come. Number five, it will not be late. Listen, God's not explaining to Habakkuk what he's going to do. He's declaring to Habakkuk what will happen. He's saying, listen, this is going to happen. Habakkuk, you may not get it. You don't understand it, but I'm telling you, this is coming. This is coming, and God is sovereign. God is making this choice. This is his plan. Now, let me just say this. There's a great comfort in the sovereignty of God, a great comfort. In fact, I think that is a solid ground for us as followers of Jesus. When everything is crazy, and the good and the bad, and the highs and the lows and the struggles, and all, all the things that happen in our life, the only solid ground we really have is that God is in control. He's in control. And somehow, in some way, in a picture that I cannot fully see, he's working all these things together for my good and his glory. It, it, he is sovereign. You are not just blown around by the winds of, of the culture around you. You're not just some pinball bounced around by unforeseen forces in this world. No, there is a God in heaven, and he is ruling, and he is on his throne. By the way, that's really good news, amen? Amen. Let me say that again. There's a God in heaven, and he's ruling, and he's in charge, and you can trust him. Amen? You can trust him that he is solid ground when everything else is fading. He said, it's going to happen. God, I don't see it happening. It'll happen. Wait for it. God, I'm trusting you. Wait for it. God, I don't know. Wait for it. God, I don't, I don't know if this will ever happen in my life. Wait for it. It's coming. My promises will always be true. You can wait for it. Now you can almost hear Habakkuk saying, maybe muttering underneath his breath. All right, God, I get it. I get it. You got a plan. All right, I get it. All right, God, I don't like it necessarily. I don't see uh, the whole picture. I, I, I don't know that it, I didn't see them all fair to me, but I get it. You're in charge. You see the big picture. I get it. I'm going to wait for it. But God, are you really going to let these people over here get away with what they're doing? These Chaldeans, man, they're terrible. It's so funny when, when things are not going the way we want, it's so easy to point to the other people. God, what about that person over there? <laughs> what about them? God, do something with them over there. You know, take care of them. You know, judge them. And I just love how God responds in verse 4. Check it out. Uh, verse 4. He says, uh, look, his ego is inflated. He is without integrity. Now, he's talking there about the Chaldeans. And he's like, yes, I know, Habakkuk. I know, I got it. <laughs> I know all about them. You don't have to tell me, you know, how bad they are. I got it. 
I know their ego is inflated. I know what's happening with them and I will take care of them, all right? I'm gonna, they're gonna stand before me. In fact, if you look down the rest of chapter two there, you'll notice there are five woes. A woe is a call of divine judgment. Notice in verse six, uh, he says, woe to him who amasses what is not his. Verse nine, woe to him who dishonesty makes wealth for his house. 12, woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed. Verse 15, woe to him who gives his neighbor a drink, pouring out his wrath and even making him drunk. Verse 19, woe to him who says to wood, wake up or, or to a mute stone, come alive. Speaking of idolatry, he goes, Listen, I know all about that. I'm gonna judge everything they're doing. In fact, in verse 20, he says, the Lord is in the holy temple. Let the whole earth be silent in his presence. Listen, I'm sovereign. I'm going to take care of them, Habakkuk, but they are not your concern. I want to talk about you. How many times does God do that for you, right? Like, God, well, what about, what about, what about? And you're like, well, well, let's just talk about you right now. God does that to me so many times. I, let's just forget about these people, Craig. Woo, bring it in to you. I need to talk about you. And Habakkuk's like, okay, so what should I do then when I feel like life's unfair? And he gives now at the end of verse four, probably the most important verse in the book of Habakkuk. This should be underlined, starred, highlighted, arrow pointed to this one first. Look at the end of verse four. He says, but the righteous one will live by faith. The righteous will live by faith. I say this is most important because it is repeated at least three different times in the New Testament. In Romans chapter one, verse 17, Galatians 3, 11, Hebrews 10, 38, the righteous shall live by faith. What is he saying? God, I don't understand. It seems unfair to me. I don't see the whole picture. And he's saying, listen, I want you to understand I'm sovereign. I'm going to take care of all these situations over here, but I want to talk about you. What I'm looking for in you is for you to walk in faith. What that means is to put your whole weight down, listen to me, your whole weight down on my faithfulness, on my faithfulness, that I am faithful and I will complete my promises and I will do justly. And although you don't understand and you don't see the whole picture, you got to put your whole weight down on my faithfulness. That's what it means to walk by faith. Listen, my friends, hear my heart. Come close to me. For the follower of Jesus, it's all about walking by faith. We're saved by faith, trusting in what Christ has done. We live by faith. We walk by faith. We die in faith. We will be raised by faith. It's all about trusting God's faithfulness. And listen, if you have trusted in him for your salvation, then you can trust him in your struggle. You can trust him in your struggle. He said the righteous one will live by faith. Are you living by faith? Are you trusting God? Maybe that looks like in the early morning, your mind rushes in from the moment you wake up with the worry and anxiety and stress of all that's happening around you. You're like, God, why is this happening? God, I don't understand. And then you say, God, but I'm gonna trust your faithfulness. God, I know that you've got a plan. I know I don't see the whole picture. So God, just for today, I'm gonna trust your faithfulness. And then at 10 o'clock, here come the struggles again. Here comes the worries again. Here comes an, oh, a, a wave, a tidal wave of anxiety. And you say, Lord, I'm just trusting God, I'm putting my weight down on your faithfulness, God. You are faithful. You are true. You are right. You're in control. And then you put your head on the pillow at night. Lord, I trust thee in your faithfulness. That's what it means to walk by faith. Some of you are aware that our church plant in Israel is right on the northern part of the country and not far from the Lebanese border. And they have been receiving missiles constantly, a barrage of missiles uh, over the last several weeks and months. 
Um, just this last week, one of those missiles landed right in front of the church building where our church plant meets and prepares meals, left a huge hole in the ground, shattering and destroying much of their building. Pastor Israel sent us pictures of what had happened and calling us to pray for them. They are not living now in that town anymore. They've relocated south, close to Tiberias by the Sea of Galilee. And they're safe. Their congregation is safe. They left their building at 2 o'clock after preparing meals. And the missile came in at 5 o'clock and destroyed them. They probably would have, several would have probably been seriously injured or died if they had not, if, if they had been there. But praise God that no one was hurt. But they made a statement, Zeev, who's one of our church planters, made the statement to Clay this week. He said, everything looks in chaos around us, but we are trusting in the faithfulness of our God. My friends, that's what it means to walk by faith. They're not saying, God, how could you? How could you allow this to happen? We're trying to serve you. We're trying. They're not doing that. They're saying, you know what? No matter what happens, we have chosen already in advance. We are trusting in the faithfulness of our God. Now, are you doing that? Are you trusting in the faithfulness of your God? I want you to bow your heads with me for just a minute. Maybe you're here today and you've got a burden. Maybe an inner war, struggling with fairness and what's happened to you, what's happening to you, what's happening around you. And from your perspective, from the picture you see, you only see a part of it and it just doesn't seem fair. But God is speaking to you. I'm in charge, I'm in control, I'm sovereign, I see you, I know you. I'm at work. There's a picture, a part of this picture you cannot see. So I need you to trust in my faithfulness that I am faithful and true and what I promise will come to pass. You will see it. Just stand in faith. Would you just surrender to him today? Lord, we acknowledge God that so many times we don't understand what you're doing. But God, we know that you're a work around us. Lord, help us to acknowledge what we cannot see. Help us to acknowledge that you are sovereign in control. Help us to get alone with you, Lord, and write down what you're speaking to us and teach us, God, to walk by faith, to put our weight down in your promises, God, because you are faithful and you are true. Draw us close to you today, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name.